Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Daniel Smith. Uh, I have Ross Philipson also here virtually. Um, we're going to do a status on trench boot, specifically discussing uh, both the, the beginning uh, as early launch capabilities, as well as the uh, new relaunch capability that we're looking at. Um, so just a review of the, uh, what we're going to go over. Uh, we'll do an update on the trench boot development, you know, review the existing state. We'll go over the new SLRT and DL stub uh, to help support the EFI stub requirements. Um, and then we'll step into the uh, secure relaunch capability, give a, uh, an overview of what we're, we're building there, and then just kind of touch on some next things uh, in a roadmap. So the existing secure launch series, um, as we, we wrote the first five iterations of this, most of the focus was on how to get the kernel started um, post dynamic launch. Um, so for those that aren't familiar, uh, when you do a dynamic launch, a hardware based dynamic launch, like you have on Intel and AMD, uh, the CPU goes into a different state. You, how to interact with it is slightly different than uh, which you're normally used to, in particular when it comes to AP uh, management. Um, so one of the things that we have to do very, very early on, as soon as we come in, is to, to get the world to look right from a CPU perspective. So a lot of the work was done in, in ensuring that's uh, correct. And then the next thing was to actually capture as accurate of a record as possible of what the Linux, the Linux environment looked like when it got started. Um, so when you take all of that, so what that winds up resulting is, is basically three areas of changes that have happened. So there's the introduction of the SL stub, which understands how the ACM or the SKL from a, um, will is expected to jump into the kernel. Um, so that way, as I state, you know, it will then set up the world correctly for the C, uh, from the CPU perspective, it'll set the, uh, uh, um, the weight block for the uh, for the APs as as it's bringing up the BSP and all that. Um, then there's the setup kernel, which we've introduced and introduces an SL main function, which kind of is the core setup logic, kind of records uh, uh, the all the measurements that it needs to be needs to be taken uh, to uh, record what the environment has. And then there's the kernel proper pieces, which is uh, through the function S launch, and it kind of provides the final setup and validation, um, while the SL module provides the runtime uh, support, so access to the uh, the DRTM log um, and and on TXT platforms access to some of the uh, TXT registers and so forth. So, what does that kind of look like? Um, this is effectively what the flow looks like for the existing secure launch. So you have a boot manager and then a bootloader, you know, with your typical EFI environments that set up the Linux kernel, puts information into the boot protocol, and then calls the DRTM event to, to trigger the CPU to uh, do the whole uh, uh, dynamic launch sequence. Um, that winds up landing you in the SL stub, which will pull information from the protocol. Um, and then passes along to the setup kernel and then to the kernel proper. So your typical flow after that point. Um, so it's key here, one of the things to understand that there's been a lot of discussions over this is that there is information that is passed across this boundary. This is why we have the Linux boot protocol setting across the boundary. This is, it. you know, the way dynamic launch is designed to work is that the untrusted environment is responsible for setting up the world that will be jumped into and it's the responsibility and there's a controlled sequence done as part of the dynamic launch to ensure that you un you actually measure what gets started. So whatever uh, gets set up on by the unsecure world will be measured before it begins executing on the secure side. All right, so just to provide a little context for so anybody that's been working on this uh, on dynamic launch for, you know, the almost 20 some years that the capability has been around always winds up leading towards the architecture which it was designed so you can see that you know the 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 similar the, the similarities are very similar between uh microsoft and what we've done with secure launch and that's not because of any copying but that's just how the architecture drives you there's a certain way it's supposed to be used 
Um, so as you can see, the same Microsoft does the same thing. They have this wind loader that basically sets up the configuration information that's going to get passed across the DRTM event. And it's the responsibility of the, D the TCP launch that was measured by the CPU to um, consume that information, measure it, and, and then you act upon it at, at that point. All right, so now we get to, to the, the wrinkle that uh, we've been dealing with for the last few months, which is uh, compatibility between uh, the way Linux uses UEFI and most uh, OSs use UEFI and how dynamic launch was intended to be used. Um, so for, for EFI support in Linux, there is the EFI stub, which is a peer entry point to the SL stub for the Linux kernel. And one of the requirements is that you know, the EFI, when you're launching in an EFI environment, the, it, the, the requirement is that you really should be going through the EFI stub for it to properly set up the kernel based off of the EFI environment. Um, so therefore, it needs to have access to boot services. Well, the, this is where the wrinkle comes in because dynamic launch can't be done until after boot services goes away because EFI expects to have control over all a, APs and when you once you tell the cpu to if you don't have all those aps in in the quiescent state the, the dynamic launch will actually fault and it could potentially lock the system um so all depend on what happens when you attempt to do the dynamic launch so so we have a situation where we need to be able to allow efi stub to do what it needs to do call ebs and then for us to then be able to do the dynamic launch um so after uh, after a, a group call that we had with uh, Matthew Garrett and and so put together by Matthew Garrett and, and with several people and we talked it over, there was a proposal to uh, implement a uh, the concept of a hook function that the EFI stub could then use to call um, to trigger the dynamic launch after it was done. Um, but the problem is, is that now causes us to have, have to go back to the drawing board, right? Because we had this flow of, of how we wanted to, to move everything. And now we have to introduce this whole new hook function that allows you to come into the kernel, come back out, and then go back into the kernel again. Um, and there's, it brings up several questions that we now have to answer, right? So as I, as I was mentioning before, it's expected that the, the pre-launch world, the unsecure world, the untrusted world, is going to configure the environment and set it up and provide it. And there's bits of information that's expected to be put there for the dynamic launch to occur. Um, so we now have to figure out a way, how do we persist this information between going into and out of the kernel and then making that, making all that information available? Where should it live? What all needs to be uh, passed in it? What should it look like? Um, and ultimately, while we're focused on Linux, we want trench boot. One of the goals for trench boot is to make all of our solutions agnostic, so that a way you can have this unified or, or common approach and implementation that occurs across any operating system kernel that uh, wants to take advantage of dynamic launch. Um, so after um, some internal meetings and and a lot of thinking, uh, we came up with uh, two aspects. Uh, there's the DL stub and the secure launch resource table. And basically what this all revolves around is the, the DL stub is the answer to the hook function and the secure launch uh, resource table, the SR, SLRT, is the answer for how do we move, how do we uh, contain all the information necessary to go between uh, the launches, uh, across the launch. Um, so the DL stub, after some discussions about where that should live, we all decided that it really, at, from a, from our implementation standpoint, it'll be a static binary that contains the minimal logic to, to get the system into a quiescent state and then trigger the logic, or tri trigger the launch, excuse me. Um, that will ensure that such a little static binary can be reused across any platform and won't have any Linux specific information necessary for it. Um, and all this code already exists for, it's effectively the, the pre-launch code that we've already had in Grub to, to trigger the launch. We can just now make it into a, just this standalone binary um, that at this point we'll probably package with Grub to put in place. Um, 
the the other piece of information or the other part of this is the slrt like i said um and it will hold all the relevant information where the dl stub was put in place by the the bootloader uh any of the dynamic launch metadata uh anything that the os needs to store in there to to um, convey what it did with the environment before we start the launch um and then all of this both the slrt and the the dl stub will get installed into memory by the bootloader so that it will link and then it will be registered in a well-known good in the configuration table on uf on efi so that way it's easily locatable for any os including in this case specifically efi stub can just look to see if the good is in the uh configuration table and if it is, it knows that there should be a hook defined in there that it can then make the call once it's done. Um, and then this same approach will, it makes it cross platform for this approach and cross architecture and cross OS. So what does that wind up looking like? Or I'm sorry, let me get to the details of SLRT before I get to the flow, apologies. Um, so the SLRT, what we went with was a, a tag length value style table design. Um, so that way we can easily expand and enable and uh, um, backwards and forwards compatibility. So in, in memory, it basically consists of a header followed by one or more entries, which are all, uh, all the entries are TLV entries. Um, and then obviously that may, then we can easily implement some helper functions to, to search across them and, and then add entries to it. Um, you know, represented here is basically for the minimal uh, table would look like for a uh, for a TXT launch, right? There is the, t the header, the DL info, so that the, the kernel knows where to find the DL stub. And then there's the TXT info for the information, the necessary information for, for TXT. Um, so with that, this is how this winds up looking uh, using that same uh, diagram that we've been working using thus far. So we have the boot manager, the boot manager can load up Linux and set up the, uh, and hand control the EFI stub. The EFI stub can make uses of, make use of the boot services as it needs. It will find, find that there's an SLRT there and therefore it will then call into the DL stub. The DL stub will make what little changes it needs to, to the SLRT, if any, and then it will trigger the launch. And then the rest of it is as we already have had in the past. Um, so this change really only kind of uh, focus, of, well, I guess there is some more changes in the SL stub and, and everything else that we have to do um, based on some of the proposals for the SRT. But for the most part, uh, the flow kind of stays the same on the right-hand side. Um, and we make adjustments on the left-hand side to deal with uh, meeting the requirements of EFI stub. Um, so with that, that, that covers uh, everything that's going on with the uh, um, early launch capability for secure launch. The next part is DRTM launch, late launch. So with DRTM late launch, um, just to, to, to bring a common understanding, uh, as far as dynamic launch is concerned, there are two types of dynamic launches, early launch and late launch. So early launch is what we've been focused on thus far, right? The coupling of a dynamic launch with the system boot. Um, so this is, that that is uh, where we've been at so far. Late launch is the next evolution of this, or the next phase of this work, which is the ability to do a dynamic launch at any time um, during the, uh, a single life cycle, power life cycle of a system. So um, you can, and it can be done any number of times, there's no limit to this. Um, so that means that if there becomes questions about the state of the system, whether you wanna go through an upgrade path through a dynamic launch without doing full hardware reboot and still be able to establish trust, this is what DRTM brings you. Um, I gave a talk a couple of years ago about all these kinds of use cases you can do with late launch. Um, late launch is really the, the killer app for, for dynamic launch because it allows us to, again, as I, I, I stated, it allows us to reestablish the DRTM measurements in the PCRs from a known well good, an, a known good starting position, specifically the CPU. Um, and then at that point, that new state can be attested to. Um, 
And one of the other things is, uh, as, I, as I know, you know, since it's going, uh, you're not actually doing a power cycle, you can preserve state across across the late launch. In particular, for a hypervisor, hypervisor could relaunch itself, but leave it and with, with its VMs paused and then um, regain control over its VMs and, and continue on. Um, so the, that brings some very powerful use cases, as I stated. Um, so for now, uh, as we're introducing this, we're gonna call this secure relaunch, just to, to brand it a little bit. Um, so how does this relaunch re, uh, work? Um, so the goal here was to introduce as little changes to the uh, to Linux as possible. Um, if we can, and what we've done in conjunction with the, uh, the, the, the work that we did for EFI with the SLRT, and these things actually wound up making this easier for us to, to be able to accomplish this without having to, to do much to the, to the Linux kernel or the k-exec user space binaries. Um, so the approach we're going right now is, as Grub already has all the support for initiating the dynamic launch event, uh, what we're going to do is introduce a new platform to Grub called gexec. And what gexec is basically done is it allows you to, um, if you're familiar with Grub, you you can basically do a make image um, with using something like uroot, which is already aware of, of dynamic launch, and build a, a bootable binary, a k-executable binary bootloader that will do a dynamic launch for you um, when, it, when it's been jumped into. Um, so it winds up providing a separate act, an entry point to capture the pat which will basically capture all the past information or the previous information that's being passed um, across the k exact image um, that will be necessary for the relaunch um it'll uh, there's some uh modifications that will have to be done to the existing uh dynamic launch code for the relaunch but overall pretty much all the changes can be contained in uh what we're already doing for grub um, and then it can be used by others if, if people prefer to use some other solution as Grub. Um, so, like I said, there will be no changes to KExec. There will be no changes to the Linux kernel to add this capability. So, using that similar flow diagrams that we've been using to, to, to express this. So, what will happen is you'll have a running Linux kernel. KExec will be fired off to, to set up the, the GExec image into memory. GXX still does the DL stub, as we, like I highlighted before, we're reusing this work. Um, uh, except for in this, play, this case, it can just jump straight to it without having to worry about going through the EFI handler. Um, go into the DL stub, the DL stub will then, you know, you populate, uh, populate the SLRT as it needs, do the event, and then we wind up on the same exact path as we did um, for the early launch on the other side. So how does, what, what would this look like? So as I stated, you just need to build uh, Grub with the, the new GExec platform. Um, once you've got it installed, all you need to do is just do a Grub make image uh, specifically for the GExec platform, um, providing it a, what your Grub config will be, which you can see in the second block there, of being able to do a secure launch uh, of the kernel without having to reboot the system. Um, so that pretty much covers the dynamic, uh, the relaunch capability. Um, so where are we going next? Uh, obviously, as we talked about, there's this new redesign that we did um, and that we're building on for the SLRT and the DL stub. So we're working to get all that um, codified into, into the patch series. Uh, so that way we can get a V6 of the secure launch kernel series out to the list for review. Um, we'll be working on getting uh, all our grub patches at least posted to the trench boots uh, uh, branch uh, tree for grub, um, so that they're all the all the grub changes are will be public and usable. Um, while we then eventually work on getting them upstream to grub. Um, obviously, since the the new series is going to introduce the SL stub or the DL stub and the SLRT. That means you need the, a bootloader capable of, of 
setting that up before calling EFI. So obviously there will be drug changes that will need to be ready for that um, before we can, uh, or that will coincide and therefore we'll, whichever one, uh, they'll have to be released together. Um, and then after we get all that work out the door, we'll be uh, hopefully having the, uh, the G exec work coming right behind it. Um, also on our roadmap or on our radar to uh, that's coming fast is you know finishing up the AMD support that that's our we already have some preliminary patches for getting those into shape for submission to the to the uh, LKML um, and then we're also uh, already starting to look forward to the uh, doing ARM DRTM uh, since their spec is in beta right now and there's work being done to enable at least in tfa uh some preliminary drtm support so it'll be we'll be able to prototype with that um so that's that's kind of where we're going with everything um just a short little plug on behalf of oracle if you're at, if this kind of stuff interests you and you really want to work on this um oracle <laughs> so um Daniel Keeper is there in the room, so if if you're interested, go. To, you can speak with him. I believe there's some flyers around uh, out there as well. Um, and so with that, any questions? Any questions? <laughs> Hello. That's too loud. Okay. Hi, I'm Dimitri from Canonical Ubuntu. Uh, can we have backwards of this to Grub 202 and Linux 415, please? Well, Grub 202 and Linux 415. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I think you're putting the cart before the horse a little bit. Um, I'd at least like to get it into the kernel before we start worrying about backports. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, with that said, we have had, I mean, we've been working on it for a time. We have, we have versions of the series that's against 415, but- um, Are you there? Uh, <laughs> can you hear can me? you not hear me anymore? Maybe he's on mute. Well, 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 did you guys, uh -oh. can you hear me now? We can hear you. I don't think the room uh, can hear me now. Uh, just I should just stop talking, right? Because I jinxed every uh, single speaker. <laughs> <clears throat> no, I think my laughter did it. It's your laughter. It was too loud. Yeah, and, 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 and everybody quit. They hang out. Because they couldn't imagine porting it back to 4.x. Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think they're coming back. Maybe. I'm still here. We, switch the chat we, we are in chat with him. Just a second. Now you can, can you hear me? Yeah. I don't know what to say. My my my. my let me. Uh, you you are very quiet. There. How about that? A bit better. Okay. I I cycled mute. Right. I don't know what I. I'm wondering if it dropped out when I, I stopped yes, sharing or something. No, it, you, are very, very, you are very, very quiet, Daniel. Yeah, from that I think it's coming from that laptop. Yeah. Whoa. Could you tell something? How, how about now? No. Is that better? Yeah, oh, from that? Oh, okay. Yeah, very you're very fine to dial. Okay, I, I can, I've got my mic, I disconnected audio and reconnected yeah. audio and cranked my mic, so I don't know what happened. Whoa. Uh, it's like he has the wrong microphone. Maybe, maybe he's on his, no longer on his Bluetooth, he's on his. I, so I was always on a USB microphone. That's better, that's better. Okay. I didn't change anything, so I don't know what happened. Okay. okay. Well, All right. so, uh, on so, slide, so to your question about 415, real quick, since uh, we're yeah. So on there. slide 14, um, so you can go through that K exec and the 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 Grub G exec version. Um, so do you wind up um, leaving a different path of PCR evidence um, for later on to say that actually you have relaunched, or is the whole point that you recover the the ev the measured boot up to uh, from the, the cold boot time 
so that the, the next time. Do you, well, do you understand the question? I'm wondering whether yeah. the evidence of the relaunch and if the verifier has to know about that or um, does it always look like a cold boot? So the, so the answer to that is that what will happen is PCRs uh, 0 through 15 will remain as they are. When you do the dynamic launch, the CPU using locality 4 will reset the PCRs in uh, 17 through 22. So, okay. so your PCRs will start with value 0. If you want an event that signifies that you went through a relaunch, then you would need to, you some information and would need to be passed for it to, to be captured. Um, the, one of the things to think about, though, is the whole purpose of doing the relaunch is you've reestablished what your your the root of your trust is, your, your and you're rebuilding your trust chain. So only the stuff that's in control now is in your already in your trust chain. It, it, the question is, is what do you want to know about your previous trusted state that's no longer in control um, when you're in your new trusted state? If you just want to know that you did it, there's it. You can easily do some. Uh, you, we could easily make the 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 ability to measure some information. You can. That's one of the niceties of the SLRT is that you can base since it's a TLV, you can stuff anything in it. And one of the things that we're doing with it is we're going to be able to do a dynamic policy uh, that the the DL stub will be able to walk through and measure what's been asked to get measured. That's one of the reasons why the, the patch series is going to, there's a bit of rework to be done in the, the SL stub side of things. Um, but that brings the benefit that you can have, you can pack extra information you want into the SLRT and just ask the SL stub to measure it to record that event for you. The SL is on the right of that trust line, right? Well, the SLT is the configuration and information being passed from the previous trusted domain right. to the new trusted domain, yes. But but the but the SL stub is on the right hand side, so it's after the relaunch, is what I'm saying. It's the new Correct. code. Yeah. Yeah, the new code will be measured by the kernel or by the the CPU, and then it can look and it can look at the uh, SLRT, measure it before it acts on any information on it. Um, so that way, there's been concerns about passing information over, and that that that's fine as long as you do the the required measure before use. Um, there's a couple of areas where we we already have some issues that you know just because of the nature of linux there's certain things that we just can't get measured before use um just a couple of command line parameters um so and there's comments flagging that out so it's it's things that we're aware of and we we try to make everybody aware of but but yes um to the backport question real quick uh so uh, what I was trying to say is we kind of put in the cart before the horse. I'd like to get stuff into the kernel before we start worrying about backporting it. Uh, but uh, but as far as older versions of the kernel, we, uh, uh, we've we been developing on the series for some time. We have versions against the older kernels. It would um, backporting. Somebody, the, there's ev there's documentation and evidence for, for anybody that would like to try to, to handle a backport. Um, and if you, uh, I'm always if you if you want to have discussions about that about what it would take to get that done, feel free to reach out to me. Um, my contact info is I, I didn't put it on the slide. I apologize, but it should be on the uh, on the uh, LPC site, um, or just ping me on wire or on on not wire. Sorry, on chat. Hi, this is Art. Um, I have a quick question about the, you mentioned uh, resetting PCRs in locality 4 for this uh, uh, secure relaunch. Mm -hmm. This is like a hardware assisted feature, right? This is a side effect of the, the CPU instruction that uh, you issue to pivot into the new, uh, the new context or not? Correct. So, on ARM, if you want to emulate this, uh, basically we have a problem if we don't have special instructions to do any of this. Yeah, so so I don't know if you're familiar with the DRTM specification. Um, uh, Stuart, you are, I was involved in the beginning, but I haven't looked at recent uh, okay. versions oh. of it. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so it is being done through an SMC call. 
um, and the design is to allow both uh, software or firmware based or hardware based solutions. Obviously, it, um, you are, you are the, the trust model on ARM is still built around, um, uh, for, forgive me, it's uh, what's the levels L0, whatever the firmware level. Yeah, zero is. yeah. Yeah. So it's so the um, so the roots uh, for firmware based, your root is based off of that. That's where your root of trust is for all that's going to lie. Um, hmm. So uh, the the benefit of this will be come when there are hardware manufacturers that are ARM chip manufacturers that decide to adopt um, a hardware in the uh, supported version. And it still will go through an SMC call, but the SMC call will be getting proxy to the hardware to trigger the event and the hardware will have control of the TPM to, to do the locality enforcement. At least that's what my understanding of the, the intent yes, is. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? Do we have any questions on chat? I don't see any. Uh, nope. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you, Daniel, for joining us. I think that uh, we have to wrap up our session. Uh, sorry for the problems at the beginning with the audio. And uh, I hope that we'll see each other next year. Uh, Daniel, uh, sorry, Michal, want to add something at the, the end. Yeah, uh, I have announced the Birds of Feather session for the presentation about Linux reset. Um, apparently, uh, the location of, of, of this presentation has changed from the meeting room 6 to the hack room 5. So, I uh, try to uh, find the new room uh, if you want to attend this um, presentation of Ron and Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, the name will be so for, for this afternoon's um, Board of Feather, the physical room doesn't change. It's uh, Hack Room 5, uh, Hack Room 6 upstairs, Meeting Room 6 upstairs. And if we are remote participants, so you can remote join through the Hack Room 5. Okay, thank you for your curiosity. Okay, see you next year. Bye, guys. Thank you for joining. <laughs>